Welcome to Part 3 of an Introduction to Educational Psychology. This presentation provides an overview of how educational psychology is related to the various steps involved in curriculum development. My name is Bill Hewitt, and I'm Professor Emeritus at Valdosta State University and Adjunct Professor at Capella University. The presentation is narrated by Jeff Hewitt, who is helping me produce these videos. In a previous presentation on frameworks and models, we discussed the importance of mental representations to help organize our thoughts. Stephanie developed a model of curriculum development that can be used to demonstrate how theories and research in educational psychology permeates the practice of teaching and learning. First, notice that the term outcomes is in the center of the diagram. This is essentially equivalent to the statement of output in the frameworks and models we discussed previously. Also, notice that the lone influence on desired outcomes are decisions that have been made prior to the beginning of the curriculum development process. That is, if a decision has been made outside of this classroom, that high scores on standardized tests of basic skills is the desired outcome for school learning, then that becomes the focus of the entire curriculum development process. However, if decisions have been made that more holistic outcomes such as social and emotional competencies are also desirable, then they will be included in the curriculum development process. Remember that these are guided by the mental representations created and held by the decision makers. If these are incorrect, the creation and implementation of curriculum will likely not have the desired effects as these impact all other facets of the process. When identifying desired outcomes, it's helpful to consider two categories. Those desired outcomes that are not likely to change over the next decade or two. These include actualizing or realizing innate human potentials that have been identified in different domains of human growth and development research, such as aspects of cognition, such as critical or creative thinking, aspects of the affective domain, such as understanding emotions and creating values, or the development of a sense of agency and using volition in implementing decisions. This could also be concerned about physical conditioning and performance, or issues related to developing a meaning and purpose to one's life. There are also issues related to the development of social and interpersonal competencies and moral character. All human beings have various levels of potential to develop competencies and capabilities in these areas that are universal and not likely to change in potential anytime soon. Researchers such as Erickson, Piaget, or Kohlberg have contributed to a very large database on development in these domains. There are human needs that have been identified that are not likely to change anytime soon, such as a need to feel safe and secure, a need to develop a sense of autonomy and independence, a need to develop competencies and display mastery in important areas in one's life, and a need to experience positive emotions and engage in positive relationships. Researchers such as Maslow and Seligman have made important contributions in this area. And of course, in these times of transformational technology driven by the digital information revolution and the globalization of communication, transportation, and economics, there are a lot of required knowledge, attitudes, and skills that must change. Beginning with the movement from agriculture to industrial societies that started some 200 years ago, the speed of change and the corresponding rate of change has grown such that all of humanity is now living with an exponential rate of change. Futurists such as Kurzweil have demonstrated that in the 20th century, humanity experienced as much or more sociocultural change that had been experienced in all previous human history. Moreover, Humanity is now experiencing the same amount of change in the first 25 years of this century, and the rate of change is speeding up, not slowing down. One of the most important areas for educators is that requirements for academic knowledge are changing from acquiring a lot of rote knowledge to the development of conceptual understanding as information is now ubiquitous and easily accessed via mobile devices. A second aspect that is changing rapidly is the movement from looking at ourselves and our world using a partial mindset that considers issues one at a time in isolation to a holistic mindset that perceives and understands the dynamic relationships, people, and the built and natural ecology in which we live. A third rate of change is the movement from thinking linearly about the rate of change goes in a straight line to exponential thinking, where change occurs in a very rapid, curvilinear manner. One factor that is likely to change is the move from the importance of critical thinking and evaluation to critical and creative thinking that focuses on innovation and problem solving. Another important change is a movement from other regulation where someone else is in charge of making decisions about what is learned to an emphasis on self-regulation and self-determination, setting goals, making plans, and analyzing feedback for personal improvement. Next, note that Stephanie advocates the assessment of the desired outcome is the next step in the process. Without some ideas about how results of any action will be considered, 
it is impossible to ascertain whether or not the desired outcome have actually been achieved. Assessment simply means that some data have been collected while measurement indicates that the data consists of numbers that can be statistically analyzed. This is one reason that academic basic skills will continue to be emphasized. Not only are they important for the digital information age, but they are also readily easy to measure, especially when compared to human potentials and human needs. However, it is possible to compile a profile of artifacts demonstrating the actualizing of human potentials such as critical and creative thinking, social and emotional skills, and self-efficacy beliefs. All of these have been identified as factors impacting student academic achievement. It is also possible to assess subjective and objective assessment of human needs such as well-being and generating positive emotions. And finally, it's possible to assess one's ability to create and use technology through the aggregation of actual products such as done in maker labs. With respect to descriptions about the learning process, a number of paradigms and theories have been generated that are relevant to educational psychology. Among them are the behavioral cognitive information processing and social learning theories that provide the foundation for teacher-led classroom practices. Another set of theories, such as humanism, Piaget's cognitive development, and Vygotsky's socio-historical theories, as well as social cognition and connectivism that provide the foundation for more student-centered classroom practices. Next in Stephanie's model are teaching activities related to classroom practices that include planning and writing objectives, instruction with the two major categories of teacher-directed instruction or instructivism, and learner-centered instruction or constructivism and classroom management and maintaining discipline. This is a skill set on which teachers demonstrate professional competence. As important as these are, the curriculum development and delivery process can still result in failure if the correct desired outcomes are not identified, reliable and valid assessments are not created, and correct views of the learning process are not established. This is why educational psychology is so important. It addresses all facets of the curriculum development process. Next, Stephanie's model acknowledges that other stakeholders than educators and learners must be considered. These influence what will be evaluated and then communicated to the parents, policymakers, and the general public. It is important to consider that this evaluation process is completed at multiple levels, from the individual to the classroom and school, and then to the district level. It is at this level that decisions are often made regarding the systemization of education as most districts still function the hierarchical model generated during the industrial age. Of course, the state and national levels are important, mainly for establishing policies and sharing of information. Finally, there are global level assessments, both in terms of basic skills achievements and the more holistic analyses of such outcome measures as well-being and lifestyles. The last component in Stephanie's model is decisions made at all of these levels that start the next round of defining desired outcomes and related components. In general, scholars interested in educational psychology are concerned about all the components in Stephanie's model, although in practice, most specialized in one of the components. As you investigate educational psychology, this is one issue to consider. Which of these components do you find most interesting to the extent you would like to contribute to the research in this area?